as a deputy dean of the University of Pennsylvania Law School. From 2009 up to 2011, Professor Berker White served in Barack Obama's administration on the Secretary of State's policy planning stock, where he was the principal drafter of the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review. Professor Berker White has advised a range of governments, law firms, investment funds on issues, including US policy toward foreign policy hotspots. He holds a bachelor in law degrees from Harvard University and a doctorate in international relations from Cambridge University, where Professor Berker White was a Fulbright scholar. In 2008, Professor Berker White received a Leo Levin Award. In 2007, he received a Gorman Award for excellence in teaching. Uh, if you permit, I will immediately summarize a few words in Ukrainian to our dear colleagues. Yes, dear please. Professor, would you permit? Of course. Thank you so much. Харківський національний університет імені Каразіна має честь оголосити гостьову лекцію професора Вільяма Берка Уайта зі школи права Керрі Пенсильванського університету. Професор Беркер Уайт є юристом-міжнародником, політологом, провідним експертом з питань зовнішньої політики США, багатосторонніх інституцій та міжнародного права. Ця лекція є частиною циклу лекцій Каразінського університету «Лекція до перемоги». За одну лекцію до перемоги спікери світу на підтримку Харківського національного університету імені Каразіна. Професор Беркер Уайт спеціалізується на вивченні взаємовідносин між правом і політикою в міжнародному плані. Його особливий досвід полягає у розробці та впровадженні комплексних рішень у сфері глобального управління за участю багатьох країн, міжнародних інституцій та багатосторонніх правових режимів. У компанії «Уайта Кейс» професор Берк Уайт співпрацює з вищим керівництвом фірми над проєктуванням, розробкою та впровадженням глобальної платформи інтелектуального лідерства в рамках однієї з провідних юридичних фірм світу. З 11 по 2014 роки професор обіймав посаду заступника декана юридичного факультету університету Пенсильванії. У 2009-2011 роках Професор працював в адміністрації Барака Обами у штаті планування політики державного секретаря, де він був головним розробником чотирирічного огляду дипломатії та розвитку, а також знакової ініціативи держсекретаря Клінтон з реформування Державного департаменту та зміни зовнішньої політики Сполучених Штатів. Професор Берк Уайт консультує низку урядів, юридичних фірм та інвестиційних фондів з питань, що включають політику США щодо гарячих точок зовнішньої політики. Він отримав ступень юриста в Гарвардському університеті, а також докторський ступень з міжнародних відносин в Кембриджському університеті. У 2008 та 2007 він був відповідно нагороджений за видатні досягнення у викладацькій діяльності. Dear professor, today one of the most powerful faculties of our university, the School of Law, is present at this wonderful event. They are very happy to greet you. It's one of the faculties which dates back to the foundation of our university, the oldest university in Eastern Europe. I would like to personally thank the Faculty of Law from the bottom of my heart for all their support in the preparation of this lecture and the project in general to express my respect and gratitude to the Faculty of Law and to its staff and to its students and absolutely uh, its dean and deputy deans this of this esteemed law faculty for finding time for for taking all efforts to be in Kharkiv under severe shelling to support this initiative and for being here today. It's a great honor. Please let me introduce our distinguished guests from the School of Law, uh, the Dean of Law, Doctor of Law, Professor Vitaly Alexandrovich Sirogin. Thank you very much for your time, for your great support, for your presence today. It's a great honor to us. Please let me also introduce the Deputy Dean for International Cooperation, PhD in Law, Associate Professor Peridori, Alexander Sergeyevich. From the very beginning of the project, Alexander Sergeyevich has also always lent me his friendly shoulder. He created every opportunity for today's lecture, and without the help of this fantastic person, this meeting would hardly be possible. He's been guiding me on a daily basis on professional legal topics regarding the lecture and has been involving all our Karazin students in every possible way. So, dear Vitaly Alexandrovich, dear Alexander Sergeyevich, thank you very much. 
my deepest words of gratitude for your presence. Just a few words in Ukrainian and I'll be silent. Сьогодні на цій прекрасній події присутній один з найпотужніших факультетів нашого університету, шановний юридичний факультет. Юридичний факультет бере свій початок ще з моменту заснування Харківського Харківського один з факультетів, який є наймогутнішим в нашому університеті, який бере початок ще з моменту заснування е, імператорського університету, найстарішого університету Східної Європи. Мені б хотілося особисто подякувати шановний юридичний факультет від щирого серця за всіляке сприяння проведенню цієї ініціативи і проєкту в цілому, висновити шану керівництву шановного факультету, викладацькому і студентському складу. Особливо Шановному керівництву університету, яке знаходить час, сили, мужність знаходитись у Харкові під час бомбардувань для підтримки цієї міжнародної ініціативи і є присутнім сьогодні. Це велика честь. Дозвольте представити е, шановних декана юридичного факультету, доктора юридичних наук, професора Віталія Олександровича Серьогіна. Ми щиро дякуємо вам за ваш час, шановний Віталій Олександровичу, за велику підтримку, за вашу присутність. Це велика честь для цієї ініціативи. Дякую вам за це. Дозвольте також раду привітати вашого заступника декана з міжнародного співробітництва, кандидата юридичних наук, доцента Передрія Олександра Сергійовича, який від початку проєкту своїм дружнім плечем, своєю підтримкою створює важливість для кожної і наразі сьогоднішньої лекції, без чиєї допомоги ця зустріч навряд чи була б можливою. Людина, яка повсякденно орієнтувала мене у підготовці цієї лекції, професійно, юридично, щодо тематики проведення цієї лекції, і всіляко долучала до цього наших юних каразінців. Шановний Віталій Олександрович, шановний Олександр Сергійович, я дякую вам за це, це велика честь для нас. Якщо дозволите, я з радістю передам вам своє слово і велику шану. Thank you so much. Дуже дякую вам за вашу присутність. So, uh, Alia, thank you. Uh, Dean um, uh, Alexander Perog, uh, and Deputy Dean Perogi, Dean Serogan, thank you. I am honored to be with you this morning. Um, and please know that uh, my thoughts are with you, uh, as are those of the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Um, as I said, I have been um, to Kiev, I've never been to Kharkiv, but uh, I very much hope to return in person uh, when um, uh, the war has been won, um, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing you then. It seemed to me that a topic that was appropriate for today's lecture um, was, uh, and I'm going to hopefully be able to share my screen here. One second, let me try the screen share again there we go, is around the topic of international criminal law, given the recent indictment of, um, of Vladimir Sergeyevich Putin uh, for the crimes that he has committed in Ukraine. And it is a topic that I have worked on as an advisor to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court uh, back when it was established 20 years ago. Uh, and it is um, uh, a topic that I have advised the US government on. Um, so it seemed very fitting for today. And the way I wanted to approach this was not just to speak about what is currently happening uh, in, in the Putin case, uh, but rather to provide a contextual understanding of the evolution of international criminal law and what that means uh, for the case that has now been brought um, against uh, Putin. And to do that, I need to take us back to 1945, because the origins of the case today against Putin really uh, harken back to what happens in World War II. The atrocities in World War II need not be repeated. We're aware of the incredible tragedy and loss of life. But prior to World War II, many of the acts which were committed while ethically and morally atrocious, were not actually illegal. Many of those acts, ranging from the war of aggression launched by Nazi Germany to the Holocaust itself, only became violations of international law with the signing of the London Charter between the Allied powers during World War II that said that 
after the war, uh, the perpetrators would be brought to justice uh, for crimes of aggression, rooted, of course, in the um, uh, kellogg briand Pact before World War II that had outlawed uh, war, and rooted in new understandings of a new crime, crimes against humanity. And it was only because the Allied powers came together to create this new structure that we saw the Nuremberg Tribunal, and that today we can see the International Criminal Court, which you see in this photo. The London Charter gave rise to the International Military Tribunal, which convened in Nuremberg in Germany uh, at the end of World War II, prosecuting the Nazi High Command for crimes against the peace, the violation of um, uh, the prohibition on the use of force, the new crime of crimes against humanity, crimes directed at a civilian population, and war crimes. And notably, Nuremberg established the concept that the commanders would be responsible for the acts of their subordinates. So even as today Vladimir Putin sits in the Kremlin and it is his soldiers that may be committing crimes on the territory of Ukraine, Nuremberg gives us the legal authority to hold him as the commander of the Russian forces responsible for those actions. Nuremberg was quite an extraordinary moment. It was a moment where for the first time we saw the most senior government leaders held responsible. It was controversial in its day. And in some ways it is still controversial. It's controversial because in the eyes of some, it was nothing more than victor's justice. Those who win the war get to impose their views and preferences on the losers. But it was something quite transformative in the development of international law. Because for the first time, it made individuals truly subjects of international legal rules. Some claimed that the court had no jurisdictional authority. Others claimed that the court lacked authority to prosecute because the crimes that were being prosecuted were not necessarily crimes when they were committed. And others said, again, this was the US and Great Britain, uh, France and Russia holding Germany responsible without authority. But Nuremberg began a powerful transformation of international law. Described best by Justice Robert Jackson, a former US Supreme Court justice um, who sat as one of the, of, of the prosecutors of the Nuremberg Tribunal, who states, that four great nations flushed with victory and stung with injury stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. I recognize that that is a complex sentence structure in English, but think about it for a moment because it is quite powerful. It says that countries that win a war and have suffered mightily during the war do not engage in an act of retribution, but rather allow law, law to decide. And that this is one of the greatest tributes that power has ever paid to reason. That law is subordinating power because the fate of those members of the Nazi high command will decided not by the gun, but by the gavel. That is the power of international criminal law. And these men who were ultimately hung after World War II were hung because a court had decided they should be. And Nuremberg created this incredible change in international law. I'm a terrible artist when it comes to making PowerPoint graphics, so you can laugh at my artwork here. But the idea is that international law is always and traditionally the thick red line, the relationship between state A and state B. It is governed by international legal rules. But what Nuremberg and international criminal law do is they allow a much more direct role for international 
criminal law, international law as a whole, to hold individuals responsible for violations of international law. Now, after Nuremberg, international criminal law sat broadly silent for nearly 40 years. It gave us a precedent, but there was no action on that precedent until in the 1990s, we see the emergence of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and then in 1998, the emergence of the International Criminal Court. But Nuremberg created the precedent that made all of that possible. And it's a precedent that fundamentally shifts how we think about the authority of a state to prosecute crimes. If you've studied domestic criminal law, I assume in Ukrainian law, it is similar, but there are usually four basic sources of authority that a government can have to prosecute a crime. Territoriality, right? A government can prosecute crimes that occur on its territory. Second, nationality, that a government can prosecute crimes if the perpetrators of that crime are, are of, of that country's nationality. Protective personality, that a government can prosecute crimes if those crimes are targeted at its citizens as such. And effects, that a government can prosecute crimes if those actions have a powerful effect on its territory. But international criminal law adds a fifth basis for jurisdiction the idea of universal jurisdiction, that certain crimes are so horrific, so terrible, that any government has the authority to prosecute regardless of the territorial or national link to the crime. Universal jurisdiction has its origins in piracy on the high seas, that pirates who sailed the seas seeking to attack the ships of other countries were deemed to use the Latin phrase, hostis humani generis, enemies of all mankind. And that any country that could apprehend a pirate could prosecute. And international criminal law takes this same logic and extends it from pirates to genocidiers, or the perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity. The idea of universal jurisdiction is that a state has the power to define and prescribe punishment for offenses recognized by the community of nations as of universal concern, such as piracy, the slave trade, aircraft hijacking, genocide, war crimes. And these are exactly the crimes that courts today, like the International Criminal Court, have the authority to prosecute. Here you see the second prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Fatua Ben Sahuda. But the question I want us to think about is what crimes are of this highest level that any government and courts like the International Criminal Court sitting in The Hague have the power to punish? The answer is about four crimes, genocide. We'll talk about each of them in a moment. Genocide is defined by the international treaty called the Genocide Convention, again, that emerged after World War II, and it's specified in the statutes of each of the major international tribunals. Crimes against humanity. There is no treaty specifying what constitutes a crime against humanity, but it is defined in the statute of the International Criminal Court and war crimes, grave breaches and other violations of the four Geneva Conventions of 1947. In addition, the International Criminal Court today also has jurisdiction over aggression. We'll talk about that more later because it's a newer development. So the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal are established in 1993 and four after the war in the former Yugoslavia and after the genocide in Rwanda. And for the first time since Nuremberg, we see international tribunals established with the authority to prosecute these most grave crimes. Back in 2001, I worked at the Yugoslavia War Crimes Tribunal, uh, assisting with the prosecution of a man who ran a rape camp in Foča in southern Bosnia. The court was housed in the building you see on the bottom left side of your screen, a former insurance 
company headquarters in the in in the Hague, um, and these courts had very narrow remit. The Yugoslavia Tribunal could only prosecute crimes in the former U Yugoslavia. The Rwanda Tribunal in Arusha, Tanzania, that you see on the right hand side, only crimes committed during the genocide in Rwanda. But these courts laid a powerful foundation of jurisprudence around international criminal law. They helped us better specify the main crimes in international law. And they held accountable the worst perpetrators of many of these crimes. You may recall visions of Slobodan Milosevic, the former president of Yugoslavia being and Serbia, being prosecuted before the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. That is an image that I hope Vladimir Putin has in his mind today, because it reminds us that even sitting heads of state can be prosecuted by these courts. So the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal are both established by the powers of the UN Security Council operating under its chapter seven authorities to maintain international peace and security. In 1993, we see UN Security Council Resolution 808 creating the Yugoslavia Tribunal, and soon thereafter, the, the Rwanda Tribunal is created by Resolution 955. The Security Council, of course, has the power to create these courts, and they begin their operation. It's a long and slow process. It's long and slow because these courts have to get set up. They have to begin investigations. They have to apprehend perpetrators. They have to get those perpetrators to the court. They have to prosecute. They have to go through appeals. And over a period of nearly 20 years, we begin to see a powerful jurisprudence emerge. There is Mr. Milosevic, formerly a president, then an indictee. Some have questioned the role of these courts. The courts spent more than $2 billion over those 20 years. And many would say they were too little, too late. If you have never read a book by Samantha Power, now the administrator of the US Agency for International Development, formerly our ambassador to the United Nations, called A Problem from Hell, you should read it because it talks about the inaction of the international community during the wars in Yugoslavia and particularly in Rwanda. And some argue that the creation of these courts was merely a way of making Western countries feel like they were doing something. And I agree, the courts were not enough. They didn't stop a genocide that killed 800,000 people in 100 days in Rwanda, killed with pickaxes and shovels. But they did, but they did put Slobodan Milosevic behind bars. And they did lay the groundwork for what we see today in the case against Vladimir Putin. Let me show you, Mr. Milosevic. And I just realized I didn't click uh, to share sound. So let me just uh, restart that. Show. Um, here is Mr. Milosevic in jail. I, the prosecutor versus Slobodan Milosevic. It's in your own best interests not to be represented. These uh, proceedings will be long and complex. Um, so what I want you to see there is that a former president is being brought to justice. Now, Mr. Milosevic, in that appearance, questions the legitimacy of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. He says that it is an illegal organ, that it has no legal foundation. And he is simply wrong because the UN Security Council endowed the ICTY with the authority to prosecute crimes that he committed. 
And while Mr. Milosevic died in jail before he could be convicted, it is, along with Nuremberg, the most powerful precedent for seeing a head of state or a former head of state behind bars in The Hague. But the other legacy of the Yugoslavia tribunals and the Rwanda tribunals was to give us a clear sense of what crimes in international law can be prosecuted by international courts. Uh, now it's saying that my screen sharing is paused. Can you see all see the screen? Yes? yes. Okay, I don't know why it says screen sharing is paused, but as long as you can see it, um, just see why this is being, there we go. Uh, there is, um, uh, a series of cases that give us um, the legal precedent for the prosecution that we see against Putin today. One of which I want to talk about is a case from Rwanda, the case of the prosecution of Jean-Paul Akayesu. Akayesu was the mayor of a small town in, um, uh, in Rwanda. And as mayor, he allowed uh, a group of Tutsi um, uh, uh, victims to uh, seek refuge in his city. And once they had arrived in his city, he allowed the Hutu genocidiers into the city who slaughtered them. And he was eventually convicted of the crime of genocide because he met a mens rea requirement and an actus rea requirement. Genocide requires first that the perpetrator have an intent to destroy in whole or in part an ethnic, racial, national, or religious group. It is incredibly difficult to prove genocide because in order to prove genocide, I need to show what the perpetrator thought in their head, that that perpetrator had the intent to destroy an ethnic, racial, national, or religious group. And then second, I must show that that perpetrator then undertook actions that involved killing members of the group, seriously injuring members of the group, preventing births within the group, or forcibly transferring children out of the group. The point of genocide, of course, is to undermine the existence of a group. And as we'll see when we look at the prosecution of Vladimir Putin today, the forcible transfer of Ukrainian children out of Ukraine and into Russian territory undertaken with an intent to destroy the Ukrainian nationality, that is genocide. And there is every evidence that what Vladimir Putin is doing today satisfies the requirements of genocide. And there you see the mayor of Taba commune from Rwanda who committed genocide in a different way, being held accountable for the crime. There have been many genocides in history. Here you see Paul Pont, the leader of Cambodia who turned on his own people genocide uh, of, of the educated and the cultured. We see genocides in Rwanda. Another case, of course, involves the Radio Mil Colin, the national radio station that broadcast a series of recordings telling people to go and commit genocide. And in that case, the court found that the radio station, even though it didn't engage in the act of genocide, was responsible for incitement to genocide, causing others to commit a genocide. That too counts. So we have genocide. The second crime the ICC may prosecute are crimes against humanity. Widespread or systematic attacks on a civilian population. And they include things like murder, enslavement, extermination, deportation, and rape. The requirements for a crime against humanity is that the perpetrator, here you see a man named Zoran Kupreskic who shelled the town that you see below in Bosnia. The perpetrator must know that their actions are part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population. They must be targeting civilians in the context of a broader attack 
on civilians. And they must murder, enslave, exterminate, deport, or rape the civilian population. Once again, when I look at the evidence that we see emerging on the ground in Ukraine, there is no doubt. There is no doubt that Russian forces under the authority of Vladimir Putin have engaged in widespread and systematic attacks against a civilian population, and that those attacks have led to murder, enslavement, deportation. So the Yugoslavia tribunal gives us genocide and it gives us crimes against humanity. Ultimately, that case is appealed. I won't go into it in grave detail. But crimes against humanity are unfortunately all too frequent in the world. Ukraine, you are not alone in suffering from crimes against humanity. Some of them my own country has perpetrated. Here you see during World War II, the firebombing of the city of Dresden in Germany. Perhaps necessary to win World War II, but a crime against humanity nonetheless. Here you see the destruction of civilian objects in Yugoslavia, the destruction of apartment buildings or a TV tower. Again, crimes against humanity committed in this case by Slobodan Milosevic. The final category of crimes that have typically been prosecuted are war crimes. War crimes are a very technical set of crimes, and in the time we have today, I won't be able to go into all of them in grave detail. But they fundamentally include breaches and grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. They include things like any of the following acts against persons or property that are not in combat, against civilians, willful killing torture or inhuman treatment or willfully causing great suffering. And when one looks today at the targeting choices of the Russian Federation, these targeting choices are clearly war crimes. They intentionally cause civilian suffering. War crimes can also involve uh, more technical choices of weaponry and targets. Fundamentally, in a time of war, as much as I may not like this, governments are allowed to target military infrastructure, and they may kill civilians in the process. Some years ago, the United States launched a military operation against Muammar Gaddafi, the Libyan president, and the U.S. used uh, technically advanced weaponry to strike at Gaddafi's compound that you see in the map here. In the process, if one or two missiles missed their targets and killed civilians where you might see some of those explosions, that's okay under international law. It's okay because the target that was chosen was a military target. There was all due course used to try to hit the military target and the civilian deaths were incidental there too. That is not a war crime. But what is a war crime is intentionally targeting civilian infrastructure. And there is no way, there is no possible way that every civilian apartment block that has been hit by Russia was a mistake or a missile that went off course. And so the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal also give us the, um, I'm going to skip ahead here a little, give us the legal foundation for the prosecution of war crimes by the Russian Federation. The final crime is new. It was not included in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court back in 1998. That is the crime of aggression. Back in 1998, the Rome Statute said that the court shall exercise jurisdiction over the crime of aggression once a provision is adopted allowing the court to do so. And it took nearly another decade for the International Criminal Court to be given authority to prosecute aggression. Today, the ICC can prosecute the initiation of an aggressive war a war that is not based on the principles of the UN Charter. After a conference in Kampala, Uganda in 2006, the state's parties to the International Criminal Court gave the court that authority. 
And today the ICC can prosecute aggression. It was always thought that it would be difficult to know whether a war was a war of aggression because so much of it is around nuance and subtlety. What were the purposes? What are the excuses or justifications? No one ever imagined that a country would launch an aggressive war with as little legal justification as that of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine in February, 2002. There is no way that that act was justifiable under international law. And it is absolutely clear to me that it constitutes an act of aggression. So I also want to say a word about who we can hold responsible for these crimes, the crimes of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, and aggression. International criminal law allows us to hold responsible the perpetrator, the soldier who fires the gun. It also allows us to uh, hold responsible those who incite genocide or war crimes, those who through their propaganda cause others to commit a genocide, those who conspire to do so. If you are part of what we might call a joint criminal enterprise attempting to cause one of these crimes, you can be held responsible. And you can be held responsible if you are a military superior who knew or should have known that the crimes would occur and did nothing to stop them or to punish the perpetrators. Here you see a Japanese general named General Yamashita. During World War II, General Yamashita was the commanding force of a, uh, of a Japanese uh, military unit. Due to weather, he lost control over his troops and contact with them. They committed horrific atrocities while he was not capable of giving them orders. After the war, he was prosecuted by a special military tribunal in Tokyo that held him responsible under the doctrine of command responsibility. It said, General Yamashita, you were the commander of these troops. You knew or should have known of the crimes they were committing. And once you became aware of the crimes and reestablished your authority over the troops, you did nothing about it. And today, international criminal law allows the prosecutor to work up the chain of command from the lowest level soldier all the way up to the president of the country and to hold the president of the country accountable where the president knew of the crimes and did nothing to stop them. As the court in the Yamashita case says, where vengeful actions are widespread offenses, and there is no effective attempt by a commander to discover and control the criminal acts, such a commander may be held responsible, even, even criminally liable. And as a result of the Yamashita case, Vladimir Putin is responsible for the actions of every Russian troop or Russian um, uh, prisoner who is committing crimes in Ukraine. Vladimir Putin is aware of these crimes. Vladimir Putin is doing nothing to stop them. And Vladimir Putin certainly is not holding the perpetrators accountable. Now, I do wanna say one thing when we talk about superior responsibility. And that is that a government will not be held responsible if they investigate and prosecute the perpetrators of crimes. In a war, crimes will be committed. Even the best intended military will still commit crimes. There's no way around it. But it is a government's responsibility, even in that time of war, to investigate and prosecute the perpetrators. And so, if there are evidence emerged that a Ukrainian soldier committed a crime at some point during this war, it is imperative that the Ukrainian government undertake appropriate investigations and prosecutions. There is no culpability for a government if it investigates itself. And that's an important lesson, one that Russia certainly hasn't thought about. 
So you had to knew or should have known, you didn't stop them, and you didn't investigate or prosecute. All right, as we build our case against Vladimir Putin, there's another issue we have to think about, and that is immunity. International law has long held that the most senior government officials are immune from prosecution, immune from the jurisdiction of the courts of foreign governments. And this idea flows from the fact that governments are fundamentally equal in international law. Sovereign equality is one of the attributes of statehood. And that means that the United States government cannot exercise its authority over the Canadian government. Nor in history, for example, could the German government prosecute Napoleon, who you see on the screen. Governments are equal, and their heads of state, therefore, are immune from prosecution in foreign courts. And this doctrine means that Vladimir Putin cannot be prosecuted in a Ukrainian court while he is the sitting president of Russia. Nor can he be prosecuted in an American court or a German court. Because as the sitting head of government of a foreign country, he enjoys immunity. This principle was reaffirmed by the International Court of Justice in a case involving the prosecution uh, by Belgium of a Congolese foreign minister who was involved in crimes against humanity. And the International Court of Justice sitting in The Hague issued a ruling in which it said, Belgium, you cannot prosecute Mr. Nodembasi because he is the sitting foreign minister of the country. You can only prosecute him once he leaves office. The day that Vladimir Putin is no longer president of Russia, he is subject to prosecution in any country in Ukraine or in the United States. But while he is president, he cannot be prosecuted in the domestic courts of a country. Because he enjoys what we call immunity rationi persona. It's based on the office you hold. It ends upon leaving office. And it is a bar to prosecution in domestic courts. Here you see, for example, um, the former Chilean dictator, Augusto Pinochet. Pinochet committed torture and other horrific crimes in Chile. And the question arose of whether he could be prosecuted by other governments, not while he was in office. Once he left office, he traveled to the United Kingdom for back surgery and was ar eventually arrested in relation to prosecutions in Spain. Once you leave office, you may be prosecuted. The second form of immunity is immunity rationi materiae, to use the Latin. This is a form of immunity that is based on the fact that a president cannot be held responsible for official acts of the government. This form of immunity for a long time prevented the prosecution of people like Henry Kissinger, the former US Secretary of State who ordered the bombing, the carpet bombing of countries like Vietnam and Laos. But today this form of immunity has broken down. It is understood that the crimes of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and aggression can never be official acts of state because no government should have the authority to commit acts like genocide and war crimes. So today in prosecuting Putin, we do have a problem with regard to immunity, immunity rationi personae, because of the office he holds. But we don't have a problem with the nature of the act because the acts themselves do not have um, uh, uh, official status. So all of that leads us to the advent of the International Criminal Court. Here, sitting in The Hague, established in 1998, it came into operation in 2002. Today, there are more than 122 states that are part of this court. Um, the court is, um, you know, this gives you a sense of the countries that have ratified the Rome Statute. Um, but we have a problem here. Neither Russia nor Ukraine have ratified the Rome Statute. And that will be a limitation. We'll talk about that limitation in a moment. The Rome Statute gives this court jurisdiction, the power to prosecute the case, if and only if 
The crime has occurred on the territory of a state party. The crime is committed by a national of a state party, or the crime is referred to the court by the UN Security Council. In the case of Russia, unfortunately, neither Russia nor Ukraine are states parties. Vladimir Putin is not the national of a state party. And given Russia's veto power at the UN Security Council, there's not going to be a referral by the Security Council. So it would seem at first glance that the ICC has no way of bringing Mr. Putin to justice. We'll explain how this is happening in a moment. But we have to remember that the court is a court of limited jurisdiction. The court only has the power to prosecute according to its statute if one of these conditions is satisfied. The second way that this is a court of limited power is that a case is only ever admissible before the court if national governments fail to prosecute. If a national government undertakes a genuine investigation or prosecution, the court must defer to the national government. In the case of the prosecution of Vladimir Putin, Russia is not about to investigate him. So this fact that the court always has to take a backstop to national governments does not stand in the way. I could go through a bunch of examples. I won't uh, for, for time. Um, but one of the things we have seen over the past uh, decade is the court becoming more and more willing to take on cases that do not fall squarely within these jurisdictional limits I've just talked about. One of the most interesting cases before the court today um, would involve the prosecution of uh, the leaders of Myanmar for crimes against the Rohingya, a Muslim population living in the Rakhine state that you see in red on the map. These people were forced by Burma out of their country into Bangladesh. That can be a genocide. Even though Myanmar is not a party to the statute, the court determined that the forced expulsion, the pushing these people out of Burma and into Bangladesh constitutes a crime in Bangladesh. And because Bangladesh is part of the court, the court determined that it has the authority to proceed. So we're seeing the ICC being more willing to sort of step a little bit beyond the narrow constraints of its jurisdiction. Um, it has, again, the power to prosecute genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and aggression. Now, what happens in an ICC case? How do one of these cases work? The first is that the case must be referred to the prosecutor, either by the uh, other countries or by NGOs and individuals or simply by the prosecutor's own decision. Once the case has been referred, the prosecutor must determine whether he has admissibility and jurisdiction. Does the case fall within the court's jurisdiction and is it admissible? In other words, is it being prosecuted by some national government? Once that's been done, the case gets sent to the pretrial chamber, a group of three judges that has to confirm that the prosecutor does have the authority to proceed. When the court was created, there was some concern, particularly from the United States of America, that the court might try to exceed its authority. And so there's lots of checks and balances built in to limit the court. And this pretrial chamber must approve an investigation. Then the court has to conduct an investigation. Often these investigations take a long time, months or years, they're difficult. The court has to get on the ground in countries that it may not have easy access to and find evidence of the crime. Then the court can issue an arrest warrant. The arrest warrant must be approved by the pretrial chamber. Once the arrest warrant has been issued, you have to arrest the perpetrators. And this has proved very challenging for the court. The court does not have its own police force. There's no sheriff who can come and arrest the perpetrators of crimes. The court must rely on the cooperation of other governments to help arrest 
these people. Sometimes it has been easy. The arrest of the first person prosecuted by the court, a Congolese warlord, the Congolese government handed him over. In other cases, like the outstanding indictment of uh, Bashar al-Assad um, uh, um, and uh, in uh, in Syria, um, well, and no, in Sudan, sorry, no one is willing to arrest him, and he is still able uh, to travel uh, and and to be outside of the court's power. But once the person is arrested, they get brought to the Hague, and they can bring preliminary challenges against the court's jurisdiction. Then there's a trial and hopefully a conviction and the possibility of appeal. Today, the court is prosecuting crimes in Uganda, Congo, Sudan, the Central African Republic, Mali, the Ivory Coast, Libya, Kenya, Afghanistan. It's investigating in Israel and, of course, as of last week, in Ukraine. So how is this court prosecuting Vladimir Putin. I said earlier that the court only has the power to prosecute crimes either in countries that have ratified the Rome Statute or by citizens of countries that have ratified the Rome Statute. And as I said, Ukraine and Russia are not parties to the court. But Article 12 of the Rome Statute says um, uh, that if the acceptance of this state, of a state that is not party to this statute, that state may, by declaration lodged with the registrar, accept the exercise of jurisdiction by the court with respect to the crime in question. So even if a country is not a party to the court, it can give the court power to prosecute crimes. It must do so in advance and through a letter to the prosecutor. And on 8 September 2015, the Ukrainian government sent the following letter to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. The letter gives the court limited power over crimes in Ukraine. It allows the prosecution of war crimes. It does not allow the prosecution of the crime of aggression uh, or of crimes against humanity. But, you know, this was sent obviously after the illegal invasion of uh, Crimea um, and gives the court power under Article 12.3 of the Rome Statute to prosecute crimes, war crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine. Um, and that is the basis of the court's authority in this case. Eight days after the invasion of, um, of Ukraine, uh, we see this letter sent by the government of Lithuania to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. The letter is a referral in which it, the government of Lithuania asks the, the ICC to investigate um, uh, to investigate the um, crimes in Ukraine. And this man, Karim Khan, the prosecutor, begins an investigation. And thankfully, there is sufficient evidence available to show that crimes within the jurisdiction of the court have been committed. Over the last year, the prosecutor had to figure out whom to prosecute. On one hand, it's easy to say prosecute Vladimir Putin, but that requires finding crimes and evidence that allow us to work up the chain of command. He also had to figure out what crimes to prosecute. Unfortunately, he does not have the capacity or the legal authority to prosecute every crime that has occurred in Ukraine. He had to ensure that he had jurisdiction and that Russia wasn't prosecuting the case itself. He had to find the evidence, and that's about where we are today. He's found the evidence, and because of that, last week, he issues an arrest warrant. The arrest warrant is a narrowly tailored arrest warrant. It only charges Vladimir Putin with the forcible transfer of Ukrainian children. That is a war crime. 
It is also an act of genocide. Why this narrow crime, given all of the atrocities we have seen in Ukraine? My answer is twofold. One, it is clearly within the court's mandate based on this letter that the Ukrainian government sent back in 2015. The prosecutor might want to charge uh, Putin with waging an aggressive war, but that is not within the prosecutor's power based on what the Ukrainian government authorized eight years ago. Second, why this crime? Because the evidence was very clear. A prosecutor always wants to charge and bring a case that he knows he can win. And even though this is a narrower case, it's a very narrowly scripted and narrowly tailored case. And I want to end momentarily with showing you uh, a video from the court uh, announcing the arrest warrant. Today, 17th of March 2023, the International Criminal Court has issued two warrants of arrest in the Ukraine situation for Vladimir Putin, President of the Russian Federation, and for Maria Vovabelova, Commissioner of the Russian President for Children's Rights, for the alleged war crimes of deportation of children from Ukrainian occupied territories into the Russian Federation. It is forbidden by international law for occupying powers to transfer civilians from the territory they live in to other territories. Children enjoy special protection under the Geneva Convention. The contents of the warrants are secret in order to protect victims. The ICC attaches great importance to the protection of victims, especially children. Nevertheless, the judges of the chamber are dealing with this case decided to make the existence of the warrants public in the interest of justice and to prevent the commission of future crimes. This is an So this day. is a quite extraordinary moment. Vladimir Putin is now an indicted war criminal. Unfortunately, neither Ukraine nor the International Criminal Court to have a means of apprehending Vladimir Putin. And I cannot say with any certainty when, if ever, he will face prosecution in The Hague. But listening to a judge standing in front of an international tribunal state the words that the president of the Russian Federation has been indicted, that is the power of law. And today, Vladimir Putin will have to make very difficult choices. The next time he wants to travel overseas, he will have to think about whether in doing so, he will be arrested. He will not go to London to go shopping. He will not go to New York to speak at the General Assembly. He may not be able to go to India for the G20 meetings. He is still a free man, but he is under house arrest. Unfortunately, his house is as large as the Russian Federation. But forever forward, he is an indicted war criminal. And that is the greatest tribute that power has ever paid to reason. Thank you very much. I hope this was interesting and informative. <laughs> Dear Professor Berkowai, that was, thank you so much. That was so impressive thank you for your most outst outstanding lecture please have mercy on me i find it hard to speak being so much impressed by what you've said if you permit if you permit if you kindly permit i will say just a few words in ukrainian yes of absolutely course. absolutely being in awe and amazed by what you've just said and being so much impressed as a person as a ukrainian as a teacher and as your listener very grateful listener today Шановна аудиторія, я висловила величезну шану і дяку професору Берку Вайт за таку фантастичну, впливову, інформативну, сповнену трагічного контенту лекцію, яка стосується подій у нашій країні. Як ви всі змогли помітити, професор Беркер Вайт апелював до механізмів і процедур притягнення до відповідальності Володимира Путіна як військового злочинця. І ми знаємо з вами, що Міжнародний суд видав ордер, ордер на його арешт, е, також е, на арешт е, відповідних людей, які звинувачуються у незаконній депортації населення та дітей з території України. У своїй лекції професор 
Берко Уайт апелював до е, прецедентів, які існували е, у нашій історії, і звертався до Нюрнбергського процесу, який, звичайно, е, завдяки, завдяки цьому процесу ми маємо е, можливість впиратися на прецедентні ситуації, коли були дослід, розсліджувалися злочини, які скоювалися проти людства, і ці злочини також скоїлися, про, скоїлися проти цивільного населення, і це дає нам право е, розглядати ці ситуації як прецеденти тієї ситуації, тому злочину, який коїться наразі Росією в Україні, коли злоч... здійснюється злочин, е, геноцид, злочин проти цивільного населення. Професор Берк Уайт наводив багато прикладів е, таких злочинів, наприклад, у Руанді, е, коли зл... здійснювався геноцид етнічної популяції цієї країни. Також е, він розглядає механізми, які лімітують і одночасно, і одночасно е, дають нам можливість притягнути е, злочинців до міжнародного трибуналу. Він розповідав про історію створення міжнародного кримінального суду і також звертався до е, тієї ситуації, яка існує на сьогодні у світі і казав, що, звичайно, в нас є інструменти, в нас є певні процедури, незважаючи на певні компоненти недоторканості, е, якими користується російська влада для того, щоб притягнути їх е, до відповідальності. І хоча е, ордер був е, виписаний на вущу справу, ніж вона могла б бути, е, це те, що можна, може бути дійсно зроблено. І е, він згадував е, дуже е, багато юридичних е, процедур і е, компонентів, які дозволяють нам пошагово зрозуміти, як здійснює свою діяльність Міжнародний кримінальний суд. Ми можемо з вами наразі задати питання, обговорити ці моменти. Він дуже радить нашим студентам прочитати книгу Саманти Пауер, яка зветься «A Problem of Hell». Також професор Берк Уайт згадував про прецедентний процес над екс-президентом Югославії Мілошевичем, який вже помер, але тим не менш цей процес відбувся і цей процес також дає нам можливість для е, цього розслідування і має, мож, дає можливість для притягнення до відповідальності Володимира Путіна як злочинця проти людства, проти цивільних, проти країни, який скоює геноцид і так само е, для притягнення до відповідальності тих людей, які це роблять під його керівництвом. Е, я прошу вас, шановна аудиторія, шановна професійна аудиторія, юридична спільнота, шановний юридичний факультет, будь ласка, якщо у вас є запитання, якщо ви хочете е, конкретно спитати про певні моменти, про певні аспекти цієї лекції, я дуже вас запрошую це зробити. І, будь ласка, я вам надаю слово, звичайно, е, всі, хто хоче долучитися до дискусії, прошу вас, будь ласка, я... Е, Доки що не бачу ваших рук, рук, але може вже є в нас перший, перша людина, яка готова, яка готова задати запитання. Dear Professor Burke, we've got our audience all ready to ask your questions with your permission. So I, with that. I, am supposed to be in a, I am supposed to be in a meeting that started at nine, so I will take a couple of questions very quickly. Absolutely. But let me, um, let me just tell my student who's waiting for me on a Zoom that I'm going to be... Uh, um, a few minutes late, sorry. Uh, I just need to send him an email. I'll ask you for one minute. He's going to tell his student about the fact that he has to answer a few questions. All right, I, will, I, am, I am ready. Let me take a couple of questions quickly. I've only got about five minutes because I have some students waiting for me. But uh, Anastasia, I see you first. Well, actually, sorry, I have no questions, but I just wanted to say thank you, really thanks a lot, because it was really impressive. I was really impressed, and it's important for us, and also you impressed me as a speaker. I've never heard such a, uh, like, influencing speaker, so thanks. You are very welcome, and Anastasia, I hope to come uh, to Kharkiv and meet you in person uh, before too long. Uh, <laughs> well. Про 
прошу, наступний, наступний наш студент, врач Кристина, будь ласка, Кристина, ваше запитання, прошу. My name is Kristina, I have a question. According to the Russia's military aggression against Ukraine, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for the president of the Russian Federation. What do you think, if the arrest warrant issued to the president who committed the crime included the issuance of the arrest warrants to other persons of the power leadership of the aggressor state? What crimes in the world against humanity would be minimized in the future or not? Yeah, I, I do think that the advent of international criminal law and showing heads of state that they will be held accountable does reduce the incidence of, uh, of, of war crimes. You know, Vladimir Putin or, uh, you know, the, the head of Myanmar these people don't want to spend the rest of their lives in jail. And so I do think it matters. They don't typically believe they will be held accountable. And so by issuing this arrest warrant, I think it changes the incentive structure. It is a deterrent um, and an important deterrent. It won't stop war crimes, but it may change people's calculation of whether to commit them in, in the first place. Uh, Danilo. Yeah. Yes, dear Mr. Wright, good day. It was a pleasure sitting on the lecture with you. It's I'm extremely grateful for your supportive position, for your work about Crimea. I have read it. Yeah, I'm extremely grateful for your support position in Ukraine. My question is for you as a professional lawyer. How do you think does International Criminal Court needs some reform? It's, uh, in my opinion, it's too much bureaucracy in the work of International Criminal Court. It's take more than a year to issue an uh, warrant only for one war crime for two people. In your opinion, does it need to be reformed for be more effectiveness of our yeah. bureaucracy? Yeah, the, the first thing I'll say is the, the biggest thing the International Criminal Court needs is more governments to help it, right? It is very difficult to collect this kind of evidence. Um, and the court has very limited resources. The United States government should have handed the court all of the satellite imagery we have. We didn't do that. You know, uh, every government in the world needs to be helping. So that's the biggest thing. Um, and if Putin tries to go to India, for example, the Indian government needs to arrest him. Does it need reform? It's a balancing act. You know, it is hard to prosecute people for difficult cases. You might have seen yesterday the former president of the United States of America, Donald yeah. Trump, was arraigned in a courtroom in New York City. It took three years, and they're trying to prosecute him on tax fraud. You know, I want to make sure we win the case, and I want to make sure the case is done fairly. So it Sorry. bothers me less that it took a year if they have the evidence to actually bring the case and win it. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Are you related to the, uh, are you doing something with the case of Trump? Are you related to it? No, I'm staying as far away from it uh, as possible. Okay, <laughs> I understand your position. Thank you for your opinion. Thank you, Mr. Um, Marina. Thank you very much. Marina. Marina, sorry. Would you please? Marina Trunenka, would you please? One moment. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are obliged to your time, and I'm so honored to be here and listen so great speech. And my question is the next to you, and I would like to get uh, your own opinion. Mm. And it's so important for me. Uh, today, for example, UK blocks um, a speech of uh, Russian uh, children's uh, commissioner, for example, but um, at the same time, for example, Hungary, an honored part of uh, ICC constitution, um, uh, has a statement that uh, they wouldn't arrest Putin under ICC warrant. And uh, um, one more thing that um, UN Commission uh, failed uh, in researching in genocide evidence in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, what do you think of uh, all this and uh, what is the perspective of this warrant? Thank you yeah. in advance. 
So we have to separate what's right from what's legally required. Any government that is a state party to the Rome Statute, the 122 countries I showed on the screen, now have a legal obligation to arrest Vladimir Putin if he steps into their territory. Every other country has to make a decision. And if he travels to Hungary and Hungary is not part of the ICC, I can't say that there is an obligation for Hungary to arrest him. Hungary should as a matter of ethics and morality. But right now what the arrest warrant really means is that Vladimir Putin cannot travel to any of the 122 countries that are part of the Rome statute system. That's important, but we now need political support. We need governments to put pressure on other countries to undertake these arrests. Um, and that's gonna take time. It is gonna take diplomacy um, by your president, by my president and others. And maybe, maybe someday we'll see Mr. Putin in jail. I hope many Thank you so much. Can uh, we please welcome. just give the just give the floor one for one second. We've got our, well, it's the, the, our Dean of the yes. Faculty of Law who wishes to say a couple of words to you with his greeting words. Dean Vitaly Alexandrovich, вам слово, будь ласка, дуже вам дуже вас просимо. Це велика честь, що ви з нами. Thank you, Professor uh, Berkway. Uh, after your lecture, international criminal law will become one of the favorite topics of our students. Thank you so okay. much. Dean, I am, Thank you I am so much. very grateful to you and consider this an offer to come and give uh, several lectures on international criminal law uh, in Kharkiv uh, when uh, the situation is, is better. Thank you so much. Let me take Kolya's question because I've seen his hand and then I have to run to, uh, to my students here in, in Philadelphia. Okay, Kolya Benik, would you please? Professor Burke would like to answer your question too. He sees your hand. Yeah. Professor Thank you. Good afternoon, Professor. I have uh, one small question. Please. Uh, what do you think are the main components? Uh, Would you like to repeat the last question? Technical problems. Well, look, let me say this okay. while Kolya is um, trying to get reconnected. Uh, forgive me for having to need to go to my own class, but I want to okay. say, first of all, thank you for having me. Secondly, if I can ever be helpful in, uh, in the future, you know where to find me. And finally, uh, I cannot wait for the victory of Ukraine and the reassertion of Ukrainian authority across its full territorial sovereignty. What you as a people have done is so inspiring to all of the rest of us who believe in the values uh, of, of, of territorial sovereignty, of independence, and the Ukrainian nation should be proud of, of what you are doing. So thank you. Dean, and I see the deputy you. dean. I cannot not allow uh, <laughs> deputy dean uh, uh, to, uh, to have the floor. Будь ласка, Олександр Сергійовичу, без вас не було б нічого. Дякую вам. Це, мабуть, без вас би не було. Дякую вам. Шановний пане професор, по-перше, дозвольте подякувати вам за цікаву, змістовну та дуже інформативну лекцію. Дозвольте у вас поцікавитись. Чи зацікавлені ви, а також університет Пенсильванії, у подальшому розвитку перспективних науково-дослідних освітніх проєктів з юридичним факультетом нашого рідного університету. Дуже дякую вам. Дякую вам, Олександр Сергійовичу. Аліна, допоможіть Burke. трохи з перекладом, якщо можна. Абсолютно. Дякую, професор Берк Вайт. Депутат Дін Олександр Педері є питання, якщо ви будете зацікавлені, the Pennsylvania School of Law і ви персонально, тому що наш університет і факультет лаву будуть радіти йти до всіх можливих санітарних, навчальних, академічних контекстів з вашою школою і з вашою кайною пермісією, вони будуть радіти залишити їхній академічній кореспонденції з вашою. Можливо, щоб організувати комунні конференції, розглядати публікації разом. Це велика гонор. 
to our faculty. Of course, please be in touch and we can think about ways to cooperate. On that note, forgive me, I'm going to say good Thank afternoon you. and farewell, but many, many thanks. Thank you so much. Alexander Sergeyevich, відповідні документи надішлемо, щоб встановити прочні зв'язки шановного юридичного факультету, фантастичного факультету з таким фантастичним керівництвом, викладацьким складом і студентами. Дуже дякую вас персонально за все, за вашу величезну допомогу, за повсякденну підтримку. Від щирого серця. У нас є команда, ми всією командою працюємо. Дякую вам. Спасибі вам, шановний Віталій Олександрович, і весь факультет. Дуже дякую. Сподіваюся, що й ми вас не розчарували сьогодні. Щиро дякуємо за співпрацю, дякую. за допомогу. Дякую. До нових зустрічей. Дякую. Шановні дякую. колеги, дякую всім дякую за активну дякую. участь, за запитання і взагалі за таку небайдужість до нашої міжнародної співпраці. Будемо її продовжувати в повномасштабному вигляді. Дорежіть себе. Дякую представникам юридичного факультету за можливості міжнародної співпраці. Дякую вам всім за вашу роботу.